Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. This one being recorded for April 11th, 2018. You know, ever since I came across the Brandon Lawson case, that's really the first case where I spoke to a family uh, directly about having a missing loved one. And that experience really motivated me to break off this show and to make Searchlight a, a weekly thing. Um, but I always remember those conversations with his father and with his long-term girlfriend and the mother of his children. Uh, and I think there's just a soft spot in my heart for certain stories where we have a parent um, that is working really hard trying to find one of their lost children and there's grandchildren involved. Um, so we're looking at another one of those cases today. It's not a super recent case, um, but we're coming up on about five years of wondering where is Ashley Morris Mullis? And here is a picture of her. And you're going to see from the name is profile, um, there's a lot going on with this mystery that unfortunately the, the name is profile just doesn't even touch on, but we will find some other sources and try to fill in these gaps here. Ashley Morris Mullis, uh, date last seen September 19th of 2013. She was 28 years old at that time. She would now be 32 years old. She is a white female um, height. They have her at about five foot six, weight approximately 115 pounds. Circumstances, she's missing from Royerton, Indiana in the county of Delaware. But as you see in the circumstances box here, Ashley just seemed to disappear. I've never quite seen one uh, that had so little information in the circumstances there, but let's see if we can find some more info here. Um, hair color brown, it was medium sh to shoulder length. Um, her eyes are also brown. Tattoos on her upper left arm is the word Ashton and a small butterfly on her right leg. Uh, they're not noting any piercings here and I don't think I've seen any photos where I can really determine if she had uh, her ears pierced or not. Um, no other real physical characteristics to go by according to NamUs. Uh, for clothing, jeans and a V-neck shirt. And unfortunately, we don't even have footwear. We don't have jewelry, uh, no accessories. We're going to learn that the circumstances around her disappearance, the details are very, very hard to come by. Transportation methods, none noted in relation to her disappearance. Uh, for dental information, they do have her charting available and it is entered. For DNA, they do have samples submitted. Their tests are complete. Uh, no fingerprint information available on her. And here in the images, we have a couple of other photos of Ashley. So what's going on with this case? Well, let's start at another website that has been um, very good to us in the past in terms of shaking out some of these details. Uh, and I just wanna give a quick shout out to Megan that works very hard to do this over at The Charlie Project. And here we can see uh, she's got a profile together, many of the same pictures that we saw at NamUs. This is noting that she was 27 years old when she disappeared. Um, all the other information seems to be the same. Uh, but for details of disappearance, we get much more info here. Mullis was last seen in Royerton, Indiana on September 19th, 2013. She was separated from her husband and each one thought the other was taking care of their two dogs. Eventually charges were filed against Mullis for neglecting her pets, but she wasn't aware of the court date and missed it. A warrant was issued for her arrest. She has never been heard from again. Now, I'm really not sure, um, I can't find a lot of detail on this aspect of the story at all. Uh, I'm not sure if if uh, Megan is trying to tell us that um, she went missing and then this charge about her neglecting her pets came out, or if this was going on before she went missing, um, which later it might allude to that, but I'm, I'm really not 100% clear on it based on this write-up. Uh, Mullis was last seen by her boyfriend's family. Due to a miscommunication between that family and her own family, she wasn't reported missing for weeks after she disappeared. And that is where uh, we get a really big hole in this case uh, because putting together a timeline in particular of the last day that she was seen becomes very, very tough when we have this type of gap of information. 
Also a little bit suspicious that, um, you know, these families aren't really coordinating their information very well around her being missing. Um, her loved ones don't believe she would have walked out of her life and abandoned her three small children, which included a two week old baby because of the arrest warrant. Uh, I think I've seen some other reports that it might actually be a two month old baby, but regardless, a very, very young child. Uh, she occasionally used prescription drugs prior to her disappearance, but it's unclear whether drugs were involved in her case. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Now, I did find another website called campalert.org. I am not familiar with this website at all. Um, I can tell you the information that I have found on it does seem to be supported by some news articles that I found on this as well. Um, but I think we just have to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. In terms of what this site is, it looks like it is a group of basically concerned citizens that are trying to put together missing persons information and share that in a concise way. So I believe their heart's in the right place. Um, I just don't know uh, the, the quality of the, the level of quality when it comes to the information, but we're just trying to get some sense of this case here. Uh, she was last seen by her friend getting her, her nails done at Muncie Nail Salon in Muncie, Indiana. She wasn't reported missing until October 10th of 2013, almost a month later. Ashley had just delivered a baby about five months before she vanished. So here we're getting another little bit of a different time frame. The father was Daniel York at the time he was married to another woman and renting one of his properties to Ashley. This relationship lasted approx approximately the two years that she was a tenant of his. Ashley's father was contacted by her estranged husband stating that he hasn't spoken to Ashley in a week and made several attempts in contacting her to no avail. Her father, Dan Morris, uh, I believe it's Don, but we'll get that cleared up later, uh, then attempted the following week to try and locate Ashley also with no success. On or about October 9th, 2013, her father spoke with Daniel York, which he claimed he didn't know where she was. Now, I believe... Uh, on the Charlie Project, when they were talking about her boyfriend's family, I believe it's Daniel's York, Daniel York uh, being her boyfriend and some members of his family that were the last to see her. Uh, he eventually did a video recorded statement with, with police after confirming with police he would speak to them only with his attorney, even though he was simply being questioned. Always sounds a little suspicious uh, when we have to bring lawyers in on a missing person case, especially that early. Law enforcement, I mean, it is worth noting there are people, that's just how they operate. So uh, it's suspicious, but not completely unheard of. Let's just put it like that. Law enforcement did search the boyfriend's residence and the estranged husband's residence to no avail. The boyfriend, Daniel York, was also the last person to see Heather, I believe it's music, uh, 22 years old, on November 17th, 2010, when he purchased a hotel room for her at the Budget Inn on West Commerce Road in Daleville, Indiana, which was subsequently burned down, killing Heather. Her family is convinced this is a homicide. Now, we're really not going into that case too much, um, but I did want to just mention that we might be seeing a pattern here of women that are involved with this man that seemingly have bad things happen to them. Um, now, Camp Alert has tried to put together a timeline here, so I really appreciate that they did that. They're pretty much the only source I've seen that has even attempted to do this. Uh, S September 16th, 2013 was the last time that Ashley's mother saw her. On the 17th, that was the last time that Ashley's family saw her at a family gathering. On the 18th, a business location which Daniel York and Ashley went to often for business stated this was the last day she ever came in with Daniel York. Uh, she had come in several times, or he had come in several times after this date without Ashley. So apparently, and we really don't know the details what type of business this is that he's doing business at. Um, but he would normally show up there with Ashley and then all of a sudden after the 18th, he's showing up on his own. So I wish we had more detail there to really understand. Is that something um, that we could really lean on in terms of, you know, it seems like the 18th might be the day that something happened to her or pretty soon after that. Uh, but we don't even know how often he visited this business. Um, this was also the day Ashley's cousin-in-law states she last spoke with Ashley. So it seems like 
18th to the 19th might be when we actually have her disappearing. Actually, no, here we go. The 19th, someone claims they saw Ashley getting her nails done in Muncie, Indiana, but there's no confirmation. This was also the day of the last incoming and outgoing call on Ashley's cell phone. So perhaps it is on the 19th that we actually have her disappear. October 13th, neighbors report a white box truck at Ashley's residence at 1.30 in the morning, moving two loads out of the house. One load from the garage and one load from the side of the house. The license plates were ran and confirmed to be that of Daniel York's wife. A little bit of a strange occurrence there, um, but we do have her missing for several weeks there. I think she has only been reported missing maybe the day before this. Um, so kind of strange to me. Uh, admittedly, we know that she's renting his property. Are they cleaning out the property thinking that she had abandoned it because she hasn't been there for several weeks? Um, I, th I think we have to consider that as a possibility or there's another possibility that they know that she's not coming back and they're starting to remove her things. November 15th, 2013, law enforcement finally searches Ashley's home and found that her clothes were all gone. Kind of interesting and really a shame it took them so long to get to that search. When questioned by detectives, Daniel York said Ashley took $15,000 and signed her parental rights over to him. So... Two of her children were with her husband, um, her estranged husband, it is worth noting. Her third child, the newest, was apparently the child of Daniel York. Uh, I'd be really curious to see some type of evidence about this money. Did he write her a check? Is there a copy of that somewhere that can be seen? Is he saying that this is cash? Uh, and if she signed her parental rights over to him, Where's that document? Has it been reviewed? Has there been some handwriting analysis on it? Unfortunately, I'm not finding a lot of detail around this. And then we get to this very, very bizarre conclusion. Daniel York has since died. His wife adopted Ashley's baby somehow and moved to Florida. So if you consider that she signed away parental rights, I don't know if that really happened or not, but if they're saying that legally they had a document saying that she signed over parental rights and then Daniel actually dies, um, I guess it makes some kind of sense that his wife, if she stayed with him through that whole period of time, which it seems like she did, uh, would in turn wind up being the primary caretaker for that child. Um, but of course, with all the mystery around this and this Daniel York aspect looking kind of suspicious, uh, I do believe it has been quite some time since uh, Ashley's parents have actually seen this child. Uh, let's go ahead and move forward to the next article at Star Press. Parents push for info on missing daughter. This is from October 27th, 2014. So just about a year, a year and 10 days, maybe a year and 15 days after she was reported missing. Delaware County Police Detective Kurt Walther said, uh, it's been a year now and it's hard to believe she wouldn't be in contact with her family. Walther said Mullis was an occasional drug user and her parents said she took prescription drugs. These are literally the only little taps on that type of information that I can find. Um, I don't know why we have the detective saying that she's a drug user. I don't know if there's something that he dug up in terms of that. Um, but this is literally the only little hint of that. Uh, her using prescription drugs actually comes up in several places. And I don't know if they mean using prescription drugs, like is she taking them according to what her doctor's telling her, or is she using them uh, in, in a recreational manner of some kind? I'm, I'm really not certain. Mullis apparently told people she knew that she was leaving the area, but Walther said it just doesn't add up. Another strange thing, um, I've reviewed quite a bit of media from her father. I haven't found any re really good detail about who would be saying that she was telling people that she was planning on leaving the area. I'd be curious to know if they were friends or family members of her boyfriend who, I mean, let's keep in mind, they might have had some type of vested interest in this if they wanted her out of the picture, but wanted to make sure that he was able to keep that baby. So I think we just need to leave that kind of in the back of our heads as we're looking at this case. And here are her parents, Don and Leandra Morris. Mullis's husband had filed for divorce before she disappeared. 
The divorce was finalized in a Delaware County court five months after Ashley Mullis's disappearance. Um, it is a little strange to me, and her father is really questions this. He just doesn't understand the mechanics of how a divorce can be finalized when she wasn't even present and knowing that her current status is being a missing person. Um, I guess if we're thinking of the scenario where she left, uh, if she decided herself that she just wanted to leave her life behind, that there needs to be some type of legal process so that people aren't stuck in a marriage like that. So I kind of understand possibly how it could happen. Um, but her father definitely doesn't understand that. And it's quite upset that it was able to be processed that way. Quote, he got divorced without her being in the courtroom, Don Morris said. So it is Don. Uh, although the Morris has added that their daughter's ex-husband lets them see their two oldest grandchildren whenever they want. Uh, you know, it's I'm always looking for the light in these stories, and that's a really good aspect. And I'm really happy that her ex-husband is a good enough person to allow that connection uh, with the children's mother's family. I think that's really, really important, particularly particularly when you have the mother missing. And quite frankly, looking at this case, there does seem to be a very good possibility that we're, we're potentially talking about a homicide that hasn't been discovered yet. So um, I, I really appreciate what her ex-husband is doing in that case. The same can't be said for their youngest grandchild, who is with the family of their daughter's boyfriend. We don't get to see her, Morris added. Walther declined to call the boyfriend a suspect. We talked to him about things, the investigator said. Really strange. Um, and, you know, just because they're not saying or they're saying that they won't call him a suspect doesn't mean that he's not being in consideration. Um, as I've kind of mentioned on the channel before, there's really kind of three levels of interacting with a case like this. You could be a witness uh, in which, you know, you might be questioned or you might have some informa information to contribute to a case. You could be a person of interest, which means that, hey, they're kind of considering that you might have some involvement in, in the case. Uh, and then, of course, they're a suspect. So there, there's these kind of different levels that it goes. And police departments all operate very differently. Some of them uh, are pretty quick to name suspects, uh, as we talked about in the Michelle Parker case. Um, and then other ones, it'll seem like they have all the proof in the world and they just will not name that person as a suspect, uh, basically until they can get a district attorney to agree that they're going to go ahead and press charges. Over at fox59.com, we start hearing about a psychic working on this case. We've talked about psychics on the channel quite a bit. I can tell you, uh, in every time I've talked to a family that has dealt with psychics, they are not impressed by the information. Several of them don't think it's helpful. A few of them actually think it's hurtful to hear what psychics have to tell them in, on some occasion. A tip from a psychic led to the discovery of bones by a film crew in Delaware County Sunday. Uh, I don't know what show this was for, but apparently some type of psychic investigation show going around with a film crew and all of a sudden the psychic says, oh, we should go look over here. And they do find some bones. Delaware County Coroner Scott Hahn was called to the scene. Investigators initially said it was unclear if the bones belonged to a human or animal, but Hahn confirmed Monday that they were not human in nature. I just, I always struggle with it. I'm still looking for the case where it's like, hey, this missing person's case, 100% cracked by a psychic. Here's the details. I have not seen that happen. I've looked into a lot of cases. If you guys know of a case where that's happened, please tell me about it in the comments below. I would certainly feature it on the channel. But I, I really haven't found that happen. And here you have... Um, you know, the family being taken on a bit of an emotional ride, hearing all of a sudden, oh, wait, you know, this psychic says that they discovered bones and there's a film crew out there shooting it. You have public resources being used as, you know, the coroner's being called to the scene. There's analysis that's being done on that. And all of it turns out to be a waste of time. So I just, I really struggle when I see cases where we have, and we have uh, psychic investigators, you know, trying to help. And it's not only psychics that can waste the time and put the families on emotional roller coasters. We have another very interesting turn in this case, and this is over at WTHR. This is an article only from March of 2018. More than four years after she was last seen, friends and family of a missing Muncie mother of three are still searching, still looking for answers. Wednesday morning, roughly two dozen people fanned out along the western edge of Prairie Creek Reservoir to follow up on a tip 
tape about Ashley Morris Mollis. Smith and others were pursuing a tip from an amateur investigator who suggested Ashley's body may have left been left somewhere in the area. I think they're missing a word there. Don Morris, Ashley's father, said he takes each tip seriously. Quote, I've had several tips and followed every one of them, Morris said. I follow every lead I can. Morris and family members suspect foul play. A spokesman for the Delaware County Sheriff's Office said while investigators still pursue credible leads, Ashley's disappearance is a cold case. Uh, now, what's going on with this investigator trying to help them out? We're going to get some more details. Uh, March 11th, 2018, over at WISH TV. On Saturday, Donald Morris hired a private canine search and recovery company to follow up on a tip he got about the Prairie Creek Reservoir area. He's hoping this independent investigation will get him one step closer to finding his daughter. The family describes the past four years as nothing short of a nightmare. They say they've done everything they can think of to bring Ashley home. They started Facebook groups, created t-shirts and banners, even tried hiring a psychic. Quote, my pain continues. My pain will continue until I get results to put my daughter to rest and I will not stop, said Don Morris. So obviously from that quote, um, he's probably thinking that the worst has happened as well. And we are talking about four years later at this point, three children that she has left behind. Uh, wouldn't be unheard of, wouldn't be absolutely unheard of if she was trying to leave her life. But uh, in this situation, I don't know. I don't know what that possibility is. Over at thestarpress.com, uh, the sheriff's department was contacted by Mullis' father, Don Morris, who announced in a live Facebook video on Tuesday that he had found the barrel and wanted police to investigate. So uh, basically out of the reservoir, there was a big black plastic barrel Um the only thing that was found in it was mud and a couple of sticks. But Don says the tip that he, well, we'll get to it later in this article. He gives us more detail about the actual tip. Uh, Sheriff Ray Dudley said mid-afternoon Tuesday that Sheriff's Office investigators were retrieving the plastic barrel from the reservoir. Asking whether Mullis' remains were believed to be in that area of the reservoir, Walther said, we didn't get any tips to that effect. He said the recent activity around Prairie Creek has been based on the claims of a gentleman who says he's a private investigator who isn't a private investigator. Mullis was last seen by members of the family of a man she was dating. County police investigators previously said they wanted to ask the man questions about Mullis. Um, I don't know why this is coming up in an article from 2018, um, because we know that that man is now deceased, but uh, apparently the author of this article didn't catch that. Her parents have sought public awareness for their daughter's case. Don Morris has stood along Muncie street corners with signs calling for his daughter's return. Um, he's kind of known for that. There's a lot of people that have commented that they have driven through and seen him uh, pretty much every weekend out there with the signs. If anybody has information related to the missing person, to this missing person or another case, please call us at the sheriff's office. Leave an anonymous tip. Contact us on Facebook or Twitter, Dudley said. You want to allow the professionals to check on these leads before personal individuals. We want to collect the evidence and we know how to handle a lead. Walther acknowledged any potential evidence in such an investigation should be handled by those who uncover it. And I just want to take a moment to support, yes, there is the strange thing that I struggle with because I do believe in what I'm considering citizen investigators, people that are looking into these cases that might be able to dig up some tips, uh, maybe through a rumor mill, maybe by combing through Facebook, even though I'm not the biggest fan of that myself personally, but I get it. There's a lot of information out there, a lot more information than a few investigators might be able to process. So I do see value in having these kind of citizen investigators. You should never call yourself a private investigator unless you're licensed though. Let me be very clear about that. However, if you do get a tip on something like this, you want the the right people to process the scene. You could contaminate the scene. I mean, what if they pulled out that barrel and the contents of the barrel went into the river and all of a sudden you've lost a bunch of evidence there? Um, 
And outside of that, there is a chain of custody that needs to be maintained with evidence so that when you do eventually get to a court case, you don't have the opposing counsel blow away that evidence by saying, hey, we don't know. There was other people that were all over this scene and they could have placed that in there. Um, there's a lot of trouble that can happen in the legal process. And ideally, we want the police to be handling this stuff so that they can do that proper work, get the proper chain of custody so that hopefully they can convince a DA this stuff is solid. We know that we process this scene properly and then get a conviction of some kind going. But um, so there's, there's many aspects to that. And I really, like I said, there's, there's a line, you know, find the information, share the information with the right people, but try to encourage the right people to actually go and process that. Over at CBS4Indy.com, Delaware County deputies believe fake private investigator is preying on missing woman's family. A few months ago, a man from Boston, Massachusetts connected with the Morris family. Investigators said the man likely heard about Ashley's story on social media. Investigators said the man told the family he was a private investigator. The man had no law enforcement experience, which just let me note, um, you don't have to have law enforcement experience necessarily to be a private investigator. Uh, it does happen frequently that a private investigator has some law enforcement experience in their past, but it's not a prerequisite. Uh, and had three active felony warrants for his arrest from other states. That is why you have to be really careful about who you have helping you in these cases, even citizen investigators. Um, it's, it's one of those things where maybe you need to do a background check if you're going to let someone run around, uh, you know, using your name and your lost loved one trying to open doors to find more information out. Um, to know this guy has three active felony warrants and that he's interacting with this family, it's, it's very concerning to me. Uh, it seems like he's taking advantage of the family, said Delaware County Corporal Kurt Walther. Uh, both family members and police believe the man created a fundraising site in Ashley's name only to take the couple of hundred dollars for himself. Ashley's family also believes the man may have been after the $10,000 reward money. Uh, this has been a long, hard road, and I need closure, Don said. On his Facebook page, Don has been active in helping other families with missing loved ones. He said he wants to make it his mission to help others in this situation in honor of Ashley. Um, so I guess I didn't highlight the details, but uh, oh, here it is right here. This tip came through that my daughter was on the backside of a reservoir, had been put in a barrel of acid, and had been thrown into the water, Don said. So I would assume that that's the information that he got from this fake private investigator. Uh, I don't know if this guy might have driven down to the reservoir before, saw that there was a big barrel floating around down there. Don apparently fishes in this reservoir, and I believe that he noted, um, or I don't know if it was him or other people that frequent that area have noted that they've seen that barrel floating around for a while. So um I don't know. It's just terrible to think that someone could be taking advantage of other people in this case like this. Uh, Don has been very active on the Searching for Ashley Morris Mullis Facebook page. He's doing a lot of Facebook Lives. Uh, and here is a picture of him standing out there with the signs like we talked about. On top of that, I did find a GoFundMe. This is a legit GoFundMe, not the false one that we were talking about in the previous article uh, started by Leandra Morris. Uh, now, this GoFundMe, just to be perfectly upfront with you guys about it, it's not necessarily to help find Ashley. It's more that the family wants to hire a lawyer to see if there's something they can do to try to get more visitation of her youngest child. And I still do believe in that cause. It's one of the heartbreaking aspects of this case. Um, so on behalf of myself and my amazing Patreon and PayPal supporters out there, uh, I'm going to be making a donation to this just as soon as I'm done shooting this video here. And I hope uh, that if any of you out there feel the same as I do about this, please consider donating to this GoFundMe. Let's see if we can get them some money to at least get some consultation from a lawyer to see if they have a chance. It's really tough because it varies 
uh, the grandparent laws vary pretty significantly from state to state. So you really need a good lawyer to look at your case and to let you know if it's even worth spending more money trying to process something around that. Uh, but with 735 bucks, I, I don't even think they can get in the door. I'm pretty sure $5,000 is probably the minimum retainer uh, for most attorneys, although they might be able to get a consultation for free. Um, or at least some type of, of lower price rather than getting a full retainer. On top of that, in the links below, you will also find a link to web sleuths as well as some, uh, as well as some other stuff that I have dug up on this case. But ultimately, it comes back to Ashley. Where is she? What has happened? Um, how can we help her father here? Um, figure out what happened to her, give her a proper burial if that's what's needed, or potentially bring her home if there's something else going on in this case, some aspect that we don't know about where maybe she, she did leave for some reason. Uh, I really haven't bumped into any information to support that theory very strongly, but we never know with these missing persons cases, so it is always worth considering. Um, she might still be out there somewhere. But I'm almost certain there are people out there that know what has happened in this case. And if you are one of those people, please, please help this man out, help this family out, get that information into the authorities using the contact information I have down in the description box below. Um, it's one of those things. If you have, a, you might have information you don't even think is important. It could be the one piece that cracks this whole thing open. Uh, so even if you feel like you've told it to, you know, a, a cop somewhere before, uh, call it in, get it into the right hands. You never know if that message got back to the the detective that's actually working this case or not. So let's see if we can get some tips drummed up on this. Let's see if we can share this story and get this picture of Ashley out there more so that more people know what they're looking for. Maybe it'll jog someone's memory about seeing her somewhere else in that time frame that we talked about between September and October 2013. Um, and let's see if we can hopefully find some answers for those three children that no doubt are going to be wondering for their entire lives, if there is no answer discovered, where is my mother and what happened to her? Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Searchlight. I appreciate each and every one of you out there that cares about these cases like I do. Uh, if you have friends in the Indiana area, please share this video with them. I really, really appreciate it. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here on the Lord and Arch channel.